welcome to my YouTube channel, guys. Today I am going to make a new video. So please, sabar kara, sabar whatever. Okay, thank you. I mean, the curious thing I suppose about uh, Preston Front was that very often the the characters that you're asked to play as an actor are very different from your natural inclination and your your own experience. But but that wasn't the case with you, was it, Dave? Because I mean, you know, very different from many other actors, you you were actually in the TA while you were at drama school, weren't you? Right, have a look at chapter nine. Ah, yeah, trucks out of lakes, easy. Well, I just remember seeing, you know, going in the water and finding that it actually came up to my chin. You know, just just pretend you come from Blackburn. You can do the actual <laughs> country death. All these other people just going, no! <laughs> My favourite line of the whole of the script was hodgepodge splodge. It was horrible. It was horrible. <laughs> Not the face! <laughs> well, I can remember the, uh, the first letter, the first episode went out. And uh, only because you've got an idea of how it's gone down. And, uh, or indeed whether anybody watched it at all, it's such as the nature of television. And I was listening to the radio th the next morning, and uh, this bloke phoned and said, I, I uh, watched this uh, television programme on BBC One uh, last night called All Quiet on the Preston Front. And I held my breath and I thought, oh, did he like it, did he not? Oh my God, what's he going to say? And he said, uh, and uh, I'd, just, I'd look, just like to ask, uh, my hobby is going round garden centres, and I'd love to know where was the god? Oh, for Christ! <laughs> My husband sent me to get some patio lights. Do you think six of these will be enough? Six of those will light up your patio beautifully, madam. The only trouble is you may also run the risk of having light aircraft landing in your garden. Pardon? Is your husband involved in the illegal nighttime shipment of narcotics? It's just for barbecues, really. Because I, I was cast only a week or so before we all had to go yes. off to the, the TA week. It had a name, didn't it? I can't remember. Oh, I can't remember what it was called now. There was a um, special operation... I'm sure McCready will remember. <laughs> operation Bold Thespian. That's the one, yeah. Operation Bold Thespian was set up specifically by the TA. Yeah. To basically give us six weeks' worth of basic training in five so days. To turn actors... In, yeah. <laughs> turn actors into... passable... Yeah. ...soldiers. Shut you ugly in the lot! You're the one who's bubbling! Ah! We were contractually obliged to do it. Are we? Uh, yeah, we were contractually obliged to do it. I think it was it a week. It was for most people. It was a week. Uh, Some people didn't do the full week. A, a week, a week at at, at um, Bath. the headquarters in Bath. Right. Um, <laughs> which was certainly an eye opener. <laughs> <laughs> we all arrived at the camp in the afternoon, and we had a a um, a quick introduction to the the rifle. <laughs> And oh, then we had a quick um, square bashing session to teach us how to stand in a straight line right. and uh, salute. Mm. <laughs> the first hour was just talking about security. I think, I mean, quite seriously, you know. This the, is uh, real. This is real. This is real. Um, the terrorists don't know that you're actors. That's it. And then we just went and got drunk, and then the next morning we were up at um, half past five yeah. and just taken for a four mile run. Mm. Which, um, which uh, everyone, really well. everyone, including myself, well, about four people vomited yeah. as soon as we finished it. Because we had. Egg and beans and <laughs> toast and <laughs> it was horrible. It was horrible. Absolutely horrible. How long did you last on Operation Bowl Thespian? Oh, jeepers! I don't know. A few days. So it's, it's all a blur <laughs> now. I did last the full you five did. days. I you lasted the whole thing, didn't you? I did. But there's only one thing I didn't do, and that was swimming in that uh, lake because um, it was full of it's full of leeches, and we had to mm. go across one by one, and. Um, I um, pretended to be really ill. <laughs> I started crying <laughs> to these sergeant guys. <laughs> Very embarrassing. He said, "What's the matter with you?" And I said, oh, "I said, oh, I think I've got, you know, um, sickle cell." <laughs> <laughs> I said, the only thing I could think of that he wouldn't know anything about. And he went, "Oh, oh, okay. Then, well, you, you stay here." Then I went, "Oh, thanks." <laughs> My dad was actually in the in the Marines, so I, I kind of mm. knew a few little things anyway. And mm. uh, actually, on the on the course, we were getting taught about section attacks <laughs> and how to do it. And there was like, a corporal standing up there shouting at everyone, saying, "Right, why do you think you do that?" And I just went, "Well, it's because of this." <laughs> he went, "Yes, right." <laughs> <laughs> to be absolutely fair to them, they did a fantastic job, really, because mm. the amount of kudos that we got from the military over the way that we conducted ourselves. Mm 
when we're actually, you know, just, just the way you hold a gun. Yes. Or a, a rifle, sorry. Yeah, and, and not calling them <laughs> And not calling bullets, them, yeah. That everything was rounds and, yeah. and, and, and that there was, I remember being a big deal about the way that you hold, you put on you. Your beret. Your beret. Well, miss you airborne, you, you can't by just go over your left eye, but you could sneakily try and get it a little bit further out to be killed. Right. So that's relatively, I think, kind of relatively killed. However, right. the BBC tend to have people <laughs> who look like Iraqi <laughs> policemen, like that. And there was a moment, there was a moment the first, on the first day where um, they kind of got it wrong and they had us all wearing them. We did get a couple of letters about that actually. Well. Which was completely wrong. Yeah. I, think I mean there's wrong and there's stupid you know, isn't there? I mean it was a little pedantic I felt, you know. Dear the BBC, yeah. I spent 30 years in the army and never wore a hat in the shape of a bear's head. <laughs> Off centre vision, Corporal. Go on. Uh, you look to one side of the object. How much to one side? Well, just a bit. The army doesn't acknowledge the bit as a unit of measurement, Matlock. You're a teacher, you should know that. History teacher, Corporal. Shut it! They didn't organise the assault on the Falklands by saying you lot land a bit away from that rock and then you lot land a bit away from them. Then we'll all run up the hill a bit. The army runs on specifics, Matlock. Razor sharp, there are no puffy, fluffy bits. The bloody 360 degrees in the compass isn't accurate enough. We have 6,400 mils in ours. We do not look a bit off the object, we look 150 mils off the object. How much is that, Corporal? About that much. I spent a long time researching the, the TA and all of it was sort of useful in terms of how the TA was laid out and their mentality and how it operated, the, 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 like the, the infrastructure of it. But of course, I made the mistake of asking squaddies, have you got any funny stories? Yeah, None yeah. of which I could use because yeah, they exactly. all were about... Yeah. Getting was, drunk and... There was that time um, when we all, yeah. you know, lifted up, had curries and crapped yeah. all over the M6 yeah. as and we were going along we it. We drank each other's wee yes. for a, a laugh, yeah. 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 well, I'm top scorer yes. of Jungle Battle. He's still got another life. Yeah, go on, Eric. You can still get over the river. Not we are. To monkey. He needs a monkey for more power. Hey, try swinging on the vines. Look, he needs a monkey, I'm telling you. Yeah. Go on. No what prisoners. Two, three. three. Now. He needs a monkey. And target. Yeah. Congratulations, Commander. Normally, you need a monkey to do that. But he does develop throughout the throughout the series because he he starts off. He originally is a comic motor. He's a big prat, and of course, you can't you can't keep a character just being a big prat really for an episode, let alone a series, let alone three. Worked for me for twenty years, so. <laughs> Prepare to be gobsmacked. There was always an issue of recapping, of telling, of, of kind of going back. And in series two, it was um, Lloyd being on, the, on Nick Owen's daytime television show. Thanks, Ian. Now, a couple of months ago, our next guest was made redundant, but instead of just sitting back, he found a way of using his rather unusual hobby to get himself off the dull queue. So it's welcome to the show now, Tony Lloyd. Hello, Tony. All right, ta. <laughs> Which was a shorthand way of saying, look, this is what we do, and this is him, and that, that, that. And they all have daytime jobs as well. Oh, are, yeah. Well, uh, the Zorg works in a garden centre. Uh, Eric, well, Eric don't do know really, I suppose. Oh, cheers. I seem to remember Nick Owen being particularly good in that, actually, because yeah. it's very he hard. He fantastic. actually did it, didn't he? Yeah. And he got all those kind of... Slight yeah, those slight oh. looks off camera. Bit, beats. Yeah. What, like that? Oh, go on, fast it. Oh, great. <laughs> so many of what was ended up being written into the second series was actually found in the first series in, in, a, in a lot of the ways. I mean, it, ironically, be, because it was Drop the Dead Donkey, when you, d you didn't do the second series and you suggested, because yeah. I can remember you oh, suggesting, you suggested Alistair. Yeah. Isn't this smashing? Hmm? Five speed gearbox for economy. Three seat belts in the back. Have you seen the back seat? I'm practically sitting in it. Will you stop going on about how small it is? Do any of these buttons do all interest me? I'm missing. Also what changed specifically into the setting series was the fact that it felt more colourful as a series. Now I remember watching the first season thinking there was an awful lot of it that seemed quite, uh, quite sombre and dark. I started the whole series <laughs> off 
introducing yeah, brilliant. <laughs> a whole bunch of people who've never been on television before in camouflage in a wood at night. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't the fittest person at that time, and unlike now, I'm obviously Olympic standard. <laughs> uh, so I just remember, you know, lots of days of uh, running through fields and wading through rivers. And what was the worst scene you had to do? Um, you know, it, it, it's close. It's a close run thing between 406 of them. <laughs> um, I, I think I'm a non-swimmer. I'm a non-swimmer. Uh, I can't swim, I hate water, I'm terrified of it. Right. Um, and so the scene in the army landing craft. Come on, lady, stop! One, two, one, I'll have one! Shut it! I was assured by the army that, you know, in the history of British landing crafts, this particular model had never took on water and sank in any environment, the Pacific, the Atlantic, you know, the English <laughs> Channel, and unfortunately, you know, um, I just remember that sinking with everyone on board. I mean, it wasn't <laughs> Titanic proportions, but it, it was, uh, you know, camera equipment, camera crew. But I just remember seeing, you know, going in the water and finding that it actually came up to my chin, which is more terrifying than drowning, uh, dying a very slow, drowning, awful death. That if I stood absolutely straight, you know, it was just lapping around my chin. There was one bit where these helicopters were coming into land, and I just somebody, I think, I think it was Brian Farnham, the director, just went, run, run towards the helicopters. We'll get good shots. They'd asked if, if we could use these helicopters as gazelles. So what they did is they dropped them into the back of the shop and out and in and out like that, so it looked like they were landing. What, run towards the spinning? <laughs> Are you sure? How close do we get? The first AD, who is essentially in charge of the actors, we, we take our orders, is going like this towards the helicopter. I think Dave McQueen didn't want to do it, did he? Oh, no, no, he was the first one in there. He was the first one in there. Yeah! And we're waiting for the helicopter. It's dropped in to pop out again like that, and we run past. And we're running and running and running, and I'm at the front, and eventually I can see the white of the pilot's eyes who was going like this. <laughs> and these, all these army people just going, no! <laughs> I stopped, and everyone else stopped in the kind of Keystone Cops <laughs> manner. I turned round and I remember that Steve's helmet came off and he just booted it. <laughs> and someone turned round and someone, what was all that about? And the first AD said, I was telling you to stop. <laughs> I said, that, uh, when, that is not stop in any country in the world. That is stop. That is stop. That is go that way. And when you do it like that, it's go that way fast. <laughs> Was there never a point where you kind of thought, I can't, you know, this doesn't make, why, oh my God, he's, he's <laughs> lost it? No, <laughs> not for me, not for me, I love it. Not even it. with the ostrich? No, oh, well, I was scared of the ostrich. I was mean, it a real ostrich? There was, <laughs> there was a real ostrich? Yeah, I think, I, and there was about 30 of them at one point, <laughs> yeah. and they're all looking at me, and when they, the, the beaks are like that, and when they bite, their eyes go back to front. So it's like, it's like a, uh, like a shark thing, and I'm stuck in, I want that thing. And they said to me, um, all right, you know, just go and try and touch him. So they have to come for me all the time. Just come for me every time. And when he, uh, 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 Su Susie, it was Susie, wasn't it? The name of the ostrich. Because oh, I was in love. I was in love with Susie. That's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> she, um, they, they put, um, uh, what was it, sellotape with bits of bird seed so it would peck me. Right. Properly. And it did. It did. It pe pecked my neck. It pecked my ear. And look at her pecking his <laughs> neck. <laughs> but I didn't like the false bit with the legs at the end. No. That was that was that was funny. <laughs> now that was funny because you guys were saying no for health and safety reasons. We can't have the ostrich actually pecking your head to bits. So they had two <laughs> false legs and a guy going like that and me going. Ah! <laughs> it was good. It was good. Oh! 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 oh. I think we've got to call an ambulance. Ah! The episode with the ostrich was the first show on British television after the tributes to Diana on the Monday night. Okay. So Diana was, I think she died on the Sunday mm -hmm. and then television went into this blackout and I thought well that's it, Press and Front was scheduled for 10 o'clock on the Monday night mm -hmm. uh, um, after the news as, as it was then. And I thought well that's it, they're just going to clear the schedule and that, you know, God knows we'll be 
you know, shunted back, and I don't know what's going to happen now, but they said, no, 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 we're going to keep it on. We're going to keep Preston Front on. Uh, it's going to be shown at a later time. And, um, and I thought, hold on, what episode is it? Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my God, it's the ostrich one. And then you, and uh, to this day, all I can remember is this, this picture of Diana fading slowly to black with Elgar's cello concerto. <laughs> And the next thing on television is this. <laughs> oh, oh, oh! I had to drive the barge without seatbelts. Of course. I drove the barge, almost killed the cast and crew, I think. But remember, I went straight into the bank. That's and I said, I can't, I can't do it, I can't do it, I can't do it. You know, again, that was a, a fantastic yeah. environment for me to work in, being, you know, quite a small, compact guy. It was good to work on the barge for three days. <laughs> <laughs> the most unpleasant to shoot for me was the confrontation with Janetta at the end of Blackpool Pier, at the end of series right. one, because it was freezing. I was wearing the shortest dress that I couldn't time, get right. thermals underneath. Right. And um, makeup kept blowing menthol into my eyes to try and make me cry a bit more. And I had contact lenses then and my eyes were killing me. So that was yeah. not fun. Laura, stop being wet. That's reassuring, because I thought you were going to say you're doing the bed scene with me, but there we go. <laughs> <laughs> that was second. I, I remembered that, because I said I put in the stage direction, I think the stage direction say, ref, referred to Betty Blue. Yeah. Which is, which is great, because everybody got the film out, Betty Blue, and I've still never seen Betty Blue. I just thought, <laughs> I thought that's what it would be like. And so I think the scene ended up largely being blue. Yes, it was. It was blue. It was and, shot with a very and, blue um, line. And I, I think a strap went like that. Yes, that yeah, was it. It was absolutely. That was it. <laughs> I, was I, was, I was terrified. <laughs> What? What? Prawn moose. That's what I'm missing. But you played the piano, didn't you? Yeah, I did play the piano. I played the piano with an extraordinary... I had a lot of hair at that time. How stupid was this? I really thought that I'd just be able to play in the background and that would be it and no one would notice. And of course, you can't do that because, you know, the sound is different from each, for each tape that you then use. So I then had to play a dummy keyboard in a dicky bow in the back of that scene, looking like... Chris Waddle with this huge <laughs> permed hair and then at the end record the music on the conditions like Elton John would have like 15 microphones shoved into the piano with all the crew just sitting around watching. <laughs> the hairiest time we had uh, we were do, doing a simulation uh, house clearance exercises which we filmed in Birmingham and we were using part of an estate where it had been abandoned running out and shooting. Out. Yeah. And then the locals started to arrive and were picking up, you know, empty shells and things, these kids, and then when people had finished work, we were sort of blocked in, basically, so we were at a blind alley. All right. And the police had to come and, and rescue us. <laughs> and, uh, the, the trouble went on throughout the night, apparently. Oh, but with the rounds up there? Yeah, yeah, because, yeah, wow. you know, they, they saw all these weapons there and opportunities. Because the weapons were, were, <laughs> were they real guns? We're, we're actors! Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Leave us alone! It soon came out, all that training. <laughs> Not the face! <laughs> I had trouble shaving, used to get a very unsightly rash. And because I had to shave quite regularly for, you know, play this army character, I thought, oh, I'd just use Imac. So, there was, um, I think we'd done, we'd already done some bits with Prince, and I thought, all right, let me get a nice little, nice little clean shave, put the earmark on as normal, keep it on for 10 minutes, then get a rag, put it on the hot water, put it on your face, boom, all the hairs in the rag, smooth as a baby's bottom, <laughs> smooth as a baby's bottom. This one particular night, though, I put it on, and um, I had a glass of wine, watched a bit of telly, fell asleep. I'm supposed to keep it on for 10 minutes. I think I fell asleep for about 25 minutes and I woke up to the smell of burning hair. <laughs> and, um, you, know, you know, you know when you're late and you wake up and you go, oh my God, I'm going, you're banging into everything. I think I was doing that, I'm going, oh my God, I've got to get it off. And I took it off and my skin was red raw underneath and it was just bleeding, just bleeding. And I went to makeup next morning and it, crust, it crusted over like an overnight crust. And they went, what have you done? I went, well, you know, I said, I said, I used the Mac and I kept it on too long. But since then, that day, I've, I've never, never used it again. I hadn't passed my test before that series. So, um, I mean, I had two weeks past my driving test that the BBC actually made me do. 
um, with an instructor that had never taken any other pupil. Uh, I was his first pupil, so I, I passed somehow and then got to drive the enormous convertible, left-hand drive, uh, very rare, expensive American car over Lancashire's Hill. It's all right. You get a free call out thing on this model. It says it manual. Oh. It's only valid within 200 miles of Detroit. Because you lied your way into this show, didn't you? You were Completely very, very... Completely, faced How old were you, or where were you I, from? I was, I was still at drama school. Right. And um, I'd managed to get an agent, and they said, oh, go up for this. I was from London, originally, and grew mm. up in the northeast of England, and the, the agent I had said, oh, don't worry, darling, you know, just, just pretend you come from Blackburn. You can do the acting, <laughs> can't you, dear? And I just went, mm, yeah. And... Um, for the first audition and for the recall and the read through, um, I spent the whole time talking like that. <laughs> well, off. Yeah, 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 off everything because I was terrified somebody was going to turn around and go, "You out now!" <laughs> and it was only when we got to um, the first day of rehearsals that the director Brian Farnham said, "Well, if anyone's got any problems with the accent, go and speak to Mum at the end." And I did the. Oh, me. <laughs> and he went, yeah, you, you're, you're from Rochdale or Blackburn or somewhere. And I went, no. <laughs> I thought you were in CND. That was before Greenpeace. You changed. Well, CND moved to Tuesday nights and that's when I have aerobics. And it helped an awful lot that I, I knew Dave before and took him in for his audition at Central, Central School of mm. Speech and Drama. So I was just about to leave, so we were able to walk into the audition together and just use the, the height gag that you'd written at the, the Burmese jungle stair with, with him only coming up to here. So, uh, and I think we both kind of thought, uh, when we came out of the audition, that we thought we'd, yeah. we'd hit on something there. Why does he do that? I reckon it's from his days in the regulars. Someone's told him it's some sort of Shinto mystic jungle way of asserting authority. It don't work if they're taller than you, though. Just looks like the end of Brief Encounter. No one makes a prank out of Pete Pauls. Is it a pain in the ass filming? I mean, is it...? No, I loved it. I loved Did every you? little bit of it. I didn't want to go home. <laughs> Hodge. I remember now, you came up to me at one point and said something, and this was when you were about five, saying, I'm not, it's great, I'm not sure about this line. You didn't actually say, I'm not sure about this line. I, I don't think that Kirsty would say that. So you were obviously able, <laughs> at the age of five, to differentiate between you and her, which is very kind of freaky, actually. There's a lot of actors can't do that. He's mummy's special friend, too. He comes to our house. Uh, when we did the very first read-through, you were the only person who complained about the lines they'd yeah, been given. Yeah, I do actually remember that. Do you remember doing that? <laughs> yeah. Because I'd, what, had, what had actually happened? It was my favourite line of the whole, the whole of the script was right. hodgepodge splodge. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> And then huge at the read-through, you tried to cut it. Why did I? That's very strange. I don't know. I, I don't know why you tried no. to cut it, but I wasn't right. happy. No. <laughs> All I can remember is being is these two tiny eyes coming over the table. <laughs> and, can I, and I thought, oh, that's great, that's great. I'm getting script notes. <laughs> Four-year-old child now. He does Hodge. Come on, Kirsty. That's a good girl. Thank you. Hodge, Podge, Blodge. He makes watches disappear. Does he now? The thing that happens time and time again in the TA is that the boss at work can find out that he is suddenly working subservient yeah. to the guy that he commands and, and, and the power relationship shift and that was the whole Paulson rundle storyline. Sir, can I just say, we weren't bimbling a lot. Corporal, I was there, watching. You'd almost finish your patrol, you were a bit cocky, you dropped your guard. Keep him sweet. He's the one who writes your report. Peter? Yeah? Your new leisure club assistant, Carl Rundle. Peter Polson. Can you get a move on into that truck, Corporal Polson? Come on, Come on. Please. Quickly. 
So, the topsy turvy bit of Rundle being in charge of Paulson in the army, yeah. Paulson being Rundle's boss, yeah. um, re represented an interesting aspect of, of the way it really is mm. in the TA. Like one of the guys in the light infantry down in Bath, the major, was a taxi driver, which I, I mean. Mm. Just can't get your head around you that know, thing. you could expect the major to maybe work in a garden mm. centre or be a curator of a museum mm. or some, or you know, um, be the master of the hunt, mm. but not a taxi yeah. driver. See, I know from the regulars that most people think the TA are a bit half cock. You know, it's good to get chances like these to show them. Mr. Paulson, can I remind you that we are down to do a game? The TA public relations line is to warmly encourage participation. Not to stand in a field with an iron bar saying, come and have a go if you think you're hard enough. You rhinos, Mr. Rundle. The first time that we see Paulson really, really, really out off his territory is, you know, in the, in the toilets of the theatre, trying to, you know, bone up on Coriolanus so that he doesn't embarrass himself socially in front of his wife's face. Well, yeah, exactly. You know, his wife's friends are a different race mm. from him mm. they are quite you know not even they're not they're posh they're mm. aristocrats as far as he's concerned mm. but they're just they're middle not, class yeah. people yeah. slightly posh voices who go to theatre and he, there is no manual for that that's mm. what he can't right. there isn't yeah. in yeah. the army there's a green manual for everything yeah. sir there's a truck fell in the lake right have a look at chapter nine ah yeah trucks out of lakes easy right yeah. there isn't a manual to how can i not show my ignorance mm. Coriolanus was written in 1609. It's Shakespeare's second longest play and arguably his last tragedy. Second longest play, last tragedy. Second longest play, last tragedy. Ben? Kim? Pete? Did you get a program? Uh, no, no, I didn't actually. Well, we can get one at the first interval. There are two, aren't there? I don't know, actually. Probably. Because it's a long play, this, Coriolanus. In fact, I think there's only one of his that's longer. Would it have been his last tragedy? And that. I think we're in row E. It's always much more interesting to see those, how those guys handle emotional um, stress in a way that they can completely cope with physical discomfort. In a way, it was the point of the series, really, wasn't it? I mean, I suppose sort of, I think I sold it on the line originally of, you know, the, 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 the battles that everyone fights are in their, their personal lives, really, I think. Yeah. There was a lot of stuff from, from, you know, our lives that just kept on creeping in. Yeah. We, one stage we got very wary, you You're like, whenever you came and sat in the pub with us, we were a bit wary about telling, telling you what we got up to, because we knew that the next the notebook, script the is going to be... The notebook was coming out. <laughs> Laura, do you have any idea what it does to the male ego during lovemaking to know that his partner's lying there thinking about small pink shellfish? Well, Dave and I thought that uh, the series had arrived when we were, at, we were at my flat, and as actors do, we were watching Going for Gold with Henry Kelly. <laughs> And some bloke on there said it was his favourite programme. Right. We, yeah. <laughs> we'd arrived. <laughs>